Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to Connecticut's Old State House. I'm Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm the head of public programs here at the OSH, and we're glad to have you with us today. Um, it's always wonderful to inv have back uh, old friends, and Matt has spoken with us, I think, more times than I can actually remember. Um, so it's great to have Matt Warshower with us today. We're glad to have you with us for this month's conversation at noon, which um, should be very illuminating. It's entitled, Not Generation Z or Post-Millennials, Why Are They the 9-11 Generation? And we are delighted to have Matt with us today, and then he'll be joined by three of his students, Yesenia Karas, Christina Volpe, and Sean Batchelder. Before we get started, though, I would like to draw your attention to the flyer on your seat. We have two upcoming May and June conversations at noon. On Tuesday, May the 14th, we'll celebrate Historic Preservation Month with a program entitled Preservation, Past and Future, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the preservation of this building, uh, Connecticut's Old State House. And then on Wednesday, June the 19th, Susan Campbell, who many of you will know is um, uh, a writer with uh, the Hartford Current, she'll discuss her new book on Frog Hollow, Stories of an American Neighborhood. Please do fill out our surveys. We do actually read them and get ideas from everyone. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Matt Warshower. It's um, always great to have you here, Matt, and a very entertaining speaker. Um, Matt is a professor of history at Central Connecticut State University. He's also, many of you know I wear the hat of being head of Connecticut History Day. He's a great friend of Connecticut History Day and is going to be hosting us at CCSU in about two weeks. Um, Matt actually is an alumni of CCSU. He received his BA from there and his MA and PhD from St. Louis University. Matt has written a number of books, articles, and book chapters, including Connecticut in the American Civil War and Andrew Jackson in Context. For eight years, Matt served as the editor of the journal for the Association for the Study of Connecticut History, Connecticut History, and in 2009, Matt led a tremendous effort across the state of Connecticut to, con to commemorate, rather, um, the anniversary of the Civil War. He served as the co-chair of the Connecticut Civil War Commemorative Commission, and really for four years, I don't know how he did it, he led the state's efforts to commemorate this anniversary, personally leading a ton of public programs and encouraging other organizations across the state to take part. Um, Matt, in 2012, received the Bruce Fraser Award in Public History from the Connecticut Council of the Social Studies, and most recently, he received the Distinguished Service Award from CCSU. It's my pleasure to welcome back Matt to the Old State House. Um. What, hi everybody, what Rebecca really meant was that uh, I, she, I've spoken here more times than she wants to remember. And the only reason that she's introduced me is because Sally's sick of it. So, uh, but thank you all for coming today and a shout out to, to my friends from Capital Community College. We, we love you guys there, Hartford History Project, awesome project, great place, all right? So, um, we're going to talk about 9-11 generation, the concept of a 9-11 generation. And I don't usually do this at talks, but I actually want to read uh, a little bit to you. Uh, to sort of, because the words of, of the kids and the teachers and the adults that deal with 9-11 are, are more succinct and in some ways more powerful than anything I'm going to be able to tell you. So this is from the, the beginning, uh, the, this is from the, the, the first section of uh, my first chapter which of a book that is called Ground Zero, the 9-11 Generation. Jillian Baden Burstein was a new third grade teacher in Trenton, New Jersey on September 11, 2001. As news of the terrorist attack trickled through the school, she remembers that, quote, the day went on in slow motion and that announcements calling students for early dismissal continued to increase. Despite the kids' curiosity, we were not to discuss the happenings, but we were instructed to assure them that everything was okay. This was hard to do, especially considering few, fewer and fewer students remained in class as the day went on. The distressing quiet was broken by an innocent but alarming question from an eight-year-old. Are we going to die? Students in classrooms throughout the nation shared the same fear. Kenesha Green, a seven-year-old in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, hid in a coat cubby until her mother arrived. 
Marissa Statler, an eighth grader from Hopewell Junction, New York, remembered, quote, I was 12 years old and I was petrified. All of my classmates were leaving one by one, their parents coming to get them. I wanted to go home. I wanted to be with my parents, close quote. Florida fourth grader Michael Howard merely had to look at his teacher to know something was horribly wrong. He said, the somber look on her face was striking and has been etched into my mind ever since. She told us, we have been attacked. The next day, I woke up to a different world. Terrorists and radical Islam and Afghanistan and especially evil were now concepts that I had to deal with. Jensen Rodriguez, a kindergartner from Connecticut, was in the school cafeteria. I took only one bite of my dinosaur chicken nuggets before the librarian grabbed me by the arm, told me to grab my backpack, and took me to the office in the third level of the building where my mom was waiting with her eyes in tears. Jensen went home to chaos. The television was on and the second plane caught in a never-ending never loop of destruction slammed into the South Tower again and again. Both towers were billowing smoke. Jensen's grandmother was screaming in despair in the living room and aunts and cousins started showing up at the house. These are some of the quintessential American childhood experiences on 9-11. For many in the 9-11 generation, especially those on the East Coast, what happened at school is the core memory of that day. Stunned teachers, frantic parents arriving to whisk their children home, confusion about what was unfolding before the nation's eyes. For kids in the Midwest or on the West Coast, school was similarly chaotic or canceled. In either case, students returned home to parents and adults in crisis over what was happening. Although many of these students may not have seen how 9-11 unfolded live during the morning newscast, it didn't really matter. The news coverage was continuous for days on end, and it, that made it all too real. If 9-11 is the single most witnessed event in world history, and it is the most single uh, witnessed event in world history, two billion people, a third of the planet, see that second plane fly into the building, the, the, the South Tower live. If that is the single most witnessed event in history, then the school memory of being taken out of class, having school canceled, or returning from a very different sort of day is perhaps the most shared eight-hour experience for any generation in the history of the world. With almost 50 million children enrolled in elementary and secondary schools in 2001, that 9-11 moment represents nearly 18% of the U.S. population. All right? So think about that. So I've thought about it a little. Uh, I don't want to go too far into how I got interested in 9-11, but it's because of the Civil War commemoration. Uh, I, I, was, I was teaching, I was giving a lecture and I was talking about meaning and memory of the Civil War to a group of people who really didn't mean mu re remember much. And the Civil War, you know, 9-11 we have 3,000 people who are killed on that day and another 6,000 in the wars of Afghanistan and Iraq. The American Civil War is 720,000, right? And America doesn't remember much of the Civil War. So I, when I'm giving this lecture on the 10th anniversary of 9-11 and I see a big banner that says, 9-11, we will never forget, I said to myself, oh, oh yeah, we won't forget, we'll forget. We're already in the process of forgetting. Next year will be the first entire high school class in the United States where every single kid in high school from freshman to senior was born after 9-11. Right? What does that mean in terms of the history of 9-11? And so as I started to contemplate this and think about it, I thought, you know, I'm going to create a course. When this Civil War commemoration, when the never-ending Civil War commemoration is over, I'm going to create a course, and it's going to be a lower-level course, uh, meaning not for history majors. Uh, it's, you know, it's kids who need that history elective in school. Uh, freshmen to seniors, every conceivable major at the university, and I want to find out what do they know about 9-11 and what do they think about 9-11. When I first started teaching the course four years ago, I would walk in and ask, what do you remember about 9-11? And the most shared memory was that memory of being pulled out of class by their parents. This year, in particular, I had to switch to, what do you know about 9-11? Because the kids today don't remember anything. And so what this has resulted in for me is a really fascinating study into not just what happened on 9-11, but, but the larger meaning of 9-11 and what it meets, means to this nation and what it means to the world, but in particular what it means to this generation and how it has shaped them. Uh, and my argument is really that there are two halves to the 9-11 generation. There is a direct half, which these are the kids who remember it. They are in the midst of their adolescence. Think about 
how old you are when you are just getting ready, you know, just finishing elementary and going into middle school, and then you're maybe halfway through high school. That is the core spot of adolescence, and that's what these kids, the, 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 suddenly the world becomes just complete chaos. This has never happened to the United States before. We have been spared the, the infiltrations and the direct attacks that many other parts of the world have experienced over many, many uh, centuries of war. I mean, the last time the United States homeland had actually been attacked was uh, in the summer of 1814 during the War of 1812. So Americans had just no context from which to make sense of this, even though the Twin Towers had been attacked in 1993 by a truck bomb in the basement. Americans largely moved on and went past it. We live in a very modern, fast-paced society, and our memories tend to be fairly short. So this direct 9-11 generation, their formative, the, the formative years of their life are witness to this event. Uh, there is no mistake, it's not an accident, why 10 years later, when Osama bin Laden is finally killed, why the people who are out in the streets of America celebrating and partying are all college-age students because they were eight and nine and 10 years old when 9-11 occurred. And this, he becomes the boogeyman to them. He's the monster under the bed. And so when he's killed, the first person I heard this from was from my nephew. He was a freshman at Boston College, 18 years old. He texted me and said, did you hear? We got him. And just go and Google death of Osama bin Laden and look at the images. It's almost 95, 99% of the people out in the streets are all college age students. That is significant. It's not an accident that that is the case. For the indirect 9-11 generation, these are the kids who are too young at the time to have a memory of 9-11 or who have grown up in the aftermath of it. Okay? And so they don't necessarily have a direct memory of the event, but the world in which they live has been completely and utterly shaped by 9-11. And you have to think about what has happened in America since then. It has been economic chaos, never-ending war. We're still at war in Afghanistan. Right? Uh, troops coming and going. Uh, and just generally a sense of hysteria and chaos. There's no accident that about three, four years ago, we started seeing more and more college-age students showing up to college in serious need of mental health services and counseling services. And I think a lot of this has to do with this sort of overall sense of anxiety and chaos that has come in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, a lot of what this first chapter, part of which I read to you, is about is really digging into the psychological impact of 9-11 and what it does to the United States, and in particular, what it does to parenting in the United States. Because this sense of chaos and anxiety, I think, is best epitomized by a quote that I found that was discussing soccer moms. And they talked about, you know, there's an America before 9-11, there's an America after 9-11. And they refer to when soccer moms became security moms. And this really, in a lot of ways, defines where America is today. Uh, a lot of people like to liken or like to uh, connect or parallel, juxtapose 9-11 to Pearl Harbor. But the reality is that the two are, in fact, not the same at all. Pearl Harbor is very neatly bookended. Okay? It's got two things that prop it up on either side. On, on Pearl Harbor, we are attacked, we declare war, we fight for four years, we win an unconditional surrender against both Germany and Japan, but Japan, of course, perpetrates uh, the Pearl Harbor attack, and the war ends with unconditional surrender. There is no question at the end of the war who is victorious. We drop an atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, it is the ultimate statement of American power. That is the original ground zero in the history of the world. Ground zero, however, has two meanings. Ground zero has the meaning of the site over which a nuclear bomb detonated, but it also has a definition that says the start of something new and momentous. And so ground zero in New York City, where the Twin Towers fall, uh, is not the same as the ground zero at Pearl Harbor, which is, the, at Pearl Harbor is, is, or excuse me, not Pearl Harbor, at, at Hiroshima, where Pearl Harbor, at the end of Pearl Harbor and the dropping of the atomic bomb, as I say, is the ultimate statement of American power. We are the most powerful nation militarily, economically, 
politically and culturally, the most powerful nation in the world. Right? When ground zero occurs over Manhattan, over the World Trade Center, think about this in terms of the concept of ground zero. It is the ultimate challenge to American power, right? That someone can attack us blatantly on our own land in the most populous city in the nation and get away with it. And so it is, in one sense, it, it is this ground zero. It is a new beginning for America, as I said, a before 9-11, an America before 9-11, and an America after 9-11. And America, I believe, has continued to reel from this event ever since because it's not nicely and neatly bookended as Pearl Harbor was. The wars have never ended. America has never fully recovered from this. We're going to see a lot of this kind of thing being discussed in just a couple of years when the 20th anniversary rolls around. And uh, I think very, very importantly, I, I think uh, when Donald Trump is running for president and he talks about let's make America great again, I don't think that he really thought of this, but I think that it's directly connected to the aftermath of 9-11. Because why has America been lessened? Why is America not great? Right? Because we have been struck in some way. We have been 9-11 lessens America in some way. And the aftermath, now you know, now maybe things would have been different had the Iraq war gone the way that it was proposed to go. But it doesn't. And Iraq and the Middle East continue to be in chaos. And so all of this has to do with the history of 9-11. And there's a lot that can be learned. And so my focus in this book is to really look at 9-11, the creation of this generation, and make the very, very clear argument and determination that there are many people from this generation, even those who lived through 9-11 and can remember it, it doesn't mean they have an historical or cultural understanding of the event. Just because you live through something doesn't mean that you fully understand it, right? So my argument is that for those who, even if they remember it, and those who don't remember it, who are of this generation. The thing is they can't remember. So then what we, mu we must do is determine they can only learn. So what, in fact, should they learn? What should they be taught about 9-11? And so this has been my focal point for the classes that I've been teaching, for the book that I am writing, and for a, a group of students. So I've always taught this course at the 100 level. Uh, last spring, a year ago, I taught it at the upper level, at the 400 level, and I had an absolutely fantastic group of students, uh, juniors and seniors, who took this course. And it gave, you know, when you teach upper level classes, it gives you the opportunity to dive in, do more reading, do more research with the students, find out what their areas of interest are as they relate to the subject. And so that's what we ended up doing. And we, we thought about it that semester and we said, oh, wouldn't it be cool to go into New York City and spend a week doing research on spring break. Now, I always bring my students every single semester. I did it last a week ago today. I, I bring my 100 level class, we charter a bus every single semester, and we go to the National 9-11 Museum in New York City so that they can go there and they can see the place where this occurred and see the displays at the 9-11 Museum. And what's really fascinating about this is that many of these students who, as I say, are not history students, uh, most of them, look, everybody has been to a museum, right? How many people here have been to a museum? Everybody has been, right? How many, the, but here's the big question, how many times have you been to a museum that you know a ton about the subject before you go, right? That, is, that makes for a very, very different museum experience because you don't go in just as a consumer. You go in as an analyst, and you're looking at things, and you're trying to think, well, why did they do it that way? Why did they do it this way? This is the opportunity that my students every semester get to, to take. Uh, for this past spring break, I, I grabbed a bunch of these students from last year, and I said, let's go to New York City for spring break. I'm still exhausted, by the way. Um, so, but we went, and we spent a week in New York City, and we uh, did two days at the National 9-11 Museum. Uh, the second, first day was just to spend the day with any interruptions, walking around and checking everything out. Uh, and we, so we did that. And then the next day we went to, uh, we, we went back and we interviewed a curator and one of their education specialists. And we're, we're working on doing a documentary film about this subject. 
And so uh, that was our focal point, is to dive, do a deep dive into 9-11. The, the third day we were there, we went to the 9-11 Tribute Museum, which is a different sort of a museum that everybody who speaks there or gives tours has some sort of direct connection to the event. They are either survivors or the, the family members of somebody who perished, or they are um, first responders or they're cleanup workers. So that was a completely different you know, sort of way into the subject matter. And then on the fourth day, we went to the New York Historical Society and looked at their collections and spoke with their curator at length. And then the final day, we went over to Jersey City uh, on the New Jersey side, and we walked down the Hudson River Trail there, the walkway, and we looked at the various 9-11 monuments that were over there and had the opportunity to look at those monuments with New York City in the background of it. So in a way, we had been looking at 9-11 from the outside in, then we went to New York City and looked at it from the inside, and then we stepped back out again. And during all of this week, we were having, together and separately, various students and I were having pretty deep conversations about what we think all of this means to the United States and to this generation and also to the world. The 9-11, the I would argue to you, is the fundamental turning point in the 21st century. And it takes the world down a path that I don't think anybody expected it to go, and certainly people don't want it to go in that direction. And, and, and I argue that the Twin Towers fell across the road to the 21st century. And look at the ramifications of it. We are seeing uh, total chaos in the Middle East. We are seeing the largest refugee crisis uh, since World War II uh, in the Middle East and in Europe the rise of nationalism because of that refugee crisis and all the immigrants that are streaming across to escape violence. And uh, America itself has gone into some fairly dark places that I think are, can be traced right back to this event. So in a, in a lot of ways, uh, in history, it's often very difficult, difficult to put your finger on a specific moment in time that says this is where the turning point came. We can do that with 9-11. I, I believe that it is, uh, an incredibly important subject for America to understand. And so with that, what I would like to do is invite uh, three of my students, Sean Batchelder, uh, Christina Volpe, and Jesenia Karras up on the stage, because I figured rather than stand here and have you listen to me for uh, 45 minutes or an hour, why not have you uh, talk with some of my students who are of this generation and get a little bit of what they think they got out of this trip and out of the subject and how they're thinking about it. And this is the one thing I promise you. This subject, if you don't think about this subject much now, wait till the next two years come, okay? to the 20th anniversary of the United States. What are we going to do at that 20th anniversary, and what are the lessons of 9-11 going to be? That becomes the real question. So with that, let's talk to these guys. I shifted to a different mic, apparently. <laughs> so I, I don't know. So, uh, so this is Sean, Jesenia, Christina. I guess I would just ask you guys, uh, in regards to what I've just framed things out, I hope I did it in a concise, clear way, um, where are you guys at with the study of this subject? Because you've taken more than one class with me on this at this point, and wh where are you at in terms of the subject, in terms of how you think about the importance of it, or how you think about the concept of the 9-11 generation? Sure. Uh, I'll go first, because I, I tend to ramble, so if I get it out of the way right away, you can hear everyone else speak. Um, so I was very intrigued by how we remember 9-11. Um, and why do we do it through the objects um, that were collected after the event? You can go to nearly any city in America, and they have some sort of commemorative memorial, plaque, or piece of that day. And I was very intrigued by why we chose to take those objects, and why do objects help us remember things? Um, which very much focuses on the fact that the Twin Towers were taken down because of their cultural significance, right? They were the symbols of our economy and of our capitalistic culture in the country. Why were they targeted? Why, when these things escalate, are places of cultural significance targeted? We all know the recent events that occurred in Sri Lanka, um, and that's just one example, right? These places of uh, reverence for our communities can be used as weapons against us. And I was, I was very intrigued by that um, and some of the looting that even occurred at Ground Zero after it was happening, right? Why did people decide to steal American flags? Well, it was because that might be the only thing they'll have from their relative who perished that day 
that they'll never see again and that they'll never have an object for. And we justify that and we say that it's okay, but when do we stop that? So that's some of the things that I looked into. Our trip was very interesting as a museum professional as well, just to see how that narrative is kind of put out for us as Americans and um, again, why and how we remember. Um, so that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, um, for me, I, uh, so, so one thing that I, that I really jumped into was I realized there were a lot of, there were a lot of different perspectives, uh, not just age and generation, but also ge geographically. Um, when we were in New York, we went, to the, we went to the Historical Society, and we got to interview a few people who work there. And we were like, oh, yeah, so yesterday we went to the, to the memorial site. Uh, you ever been there? You ever go down there? And she was shocked. She was like, no, no one goes down there in New York. And, and that really struck me because as Americans, like we who don't live in New York City, we go there and we see it and we look, we look around. Um, but for New York, it's still very raw uh, and they still remember it. And, it's, and that for them is a graveyard. And so uh, that really struck for me that something that happened almost 20 years ago is still still she's living the trauma every day. And so there is, you know, New York's memory, then there's America's memory, and then there's also international memory, you know, there's Europe's memory. There might be the Middle East, of course, is remembering it a lot differently. So that's really opened my eyes to how, um, you know, how different people remember it. Sure. sure. Um, when I first started on the project, it was a year ago, when we took the original senior, junior class. And I st started with focusing on the legalities of terrorism and how terrorism was defined before 9-11. And so that was really looking into the Clinton administration, what they were doing in 1993 bombing, and I continued to compile that information. And then once we went to New York, my perspective of 9-11 completely changed. Because for about four months, or to six months really, because afterwards as well, I was looking at the macro of 9-11 on a national scale and how that affected the United States and policy and definition when going forward. And going into New York, and especially I think on Friday when we were going down to Hudson and whatnot, it made me realize that for me, how 9-11 is seen, I would argue, is the tri New York and the tri-state area, the United States, and then the international perspective, if I were to list it into three different categories. And so what New York did for me was to be able to assess those two that I was missing a year prior and that I'd studied for six months, then I got to do a deep dive into what does this mean for New York City as well as the tri-state area, especially in New Jersey, when you could see everything going on across the river, and how do you put that into a national context while remembering, like Sean had previously said, that this cultural memory of 9-11 is imprinted on these people. The grief itself is imprinted, and I think that's very important when going into it, and that's something that definitely was my strongest takeaway. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of times we, we, we think about 9-11 as a single day that occurred, uh, uh, you know, 102 minutes from the time that the first plane strikes the North Tower to the time when the North Tower actually collapses, uh, that that is 102 minutes. But it, it's much more than that. And when I say that, I mean it's, it, it's much more than even the immediate aftermath of that event not only in terms of how it impacts our nation, but in terms of being able to explain, well, why does this event happen and what happens as a result afterwards? And I think a lot of times what happens for, for people who are not necessarily involved in the study of history, they, they, they think that history is just sort of this finite moment in time. Oh, this happened. But history never exists. Moments never exist in a vacuum. There's always something that comes before it. There's always that something that comes after it that's related to it, that either influences it if it comes before, or when it comes after, it's, it comes as an after effect. There are ripples as a result of the event. And I think that this is a really important concept for people to understand. And I often have students in this lower level class where they come in and they say, at the end of the semester they really say it, they go, you know, I, I was wondering what you were gonna do in this course. How, how are you gonna fill an entire semester on one day? I mean, I don't understand how you're going to be able to do that. And by the time they get to the end of the semester, they realize, wow, we could do like three more courses on this, and I still wouldn't be completely fulfilled. That's exactly what I want. I want them to walk out of the class and go, I want to know more about this. Because again, as we say, everybody has these differing perspectives. And to me, 9-11 stands at this moment in, 
you know, at the, the cusp of the millennial, right? The Cold War has ended about 10 years prior, right? And we think that just sort of the world is going to open up to American-style democracy. And that has not been the way things have, have tailored out as a result of what the United States decides to do after 9-11 occurs. So if 9-11 stands in the minute, in the middle, there are things that lead up to it, and there are things that come after it that Americans need to know. And so as Jesenia was saying, you know, we have a tendency, especially me, I have a tendency to really think about the macro, the big picture. How does this all affect? But it, New York, the trip to New York really did help us to understand the individual personal stories of, of survivors and people who lost loved ones. But I think if that's the only, I think that's a, and I've described that as tragedy and triumph. That's the primary genre of writing on 9-11, that there's this great tragedy that befalls America, but America triumphs in the end, that we have resiliency, that America comes together, that we, we, we come together as a nation. And you know, those of us who are, who are here who are old enough to remember this event, we remember the American flags coming out, right? American flags fly off the shelves. Everybody puts American flags up in front of their houses and on their cars. I mean, they are everywhere. It is this moment of patriotism and unity, the likes of which I'd never seen in my life. That unity starts to disappear by late 2001, or by, by late 2002, early 2003, as the United States moves towards war in Iraq. And there are huge disputes over that. The single largest anti-war demonstrations in the history of the world uh, in opposition to the Iraq War and the United States' movement into Iraq. That, in many ways, impacts the history of 9-11. So I guess where I'm at is it's important to tell those individual stories of survivorship and of, of triumph and of people's lives. And we, have, we can't forget that. We also have to look at it in the macro way as well. So... So I was going to say, um, we, we discuss a lot as historians, especially in a university that brings a lot of teachers into Connecticut, um, how we're going to go and teach this history, right? And, and we talk a lot about this before and this after. And one thing I, I know that my colleagues and I have kind of realized out of all of this is that we don't consider foreign policy to be history because it's still happening, right, as Dr. Warshower kind of said. So we, we notice this disconnect between what students are intrigued by, which is the history they believe is all the way back there, like the American Civil War or what have you, that it's more difficult to teach them something that is ongoing, right? Um, so how do we kind of approach the lead up to 9-11 and the significance of it, like the 93 bombing at, at World Trade Center 1 in the basement and, and the evasion of the Iraq war and what that meant for our culture um, and what that meant for that nation's cultural heritage, right, and what happened there. Um, how do we contextualize that so that we are giving way to a generation that puts a lot of fundamental weight on foreign policy history and, and what we kind of do. It's the, it's the stuff that you really, I'm a historian of mergers and acquisitions in industrial Connecticut, so nobody wants to hear about that, right? This is another thing that's just a little bit too dry, but affects us in so many ways. So how do we make this something for generations that they, they want to know about? And I, I think um, my colleagues here can discuss that. It is that twofold, right? You need to know the lead up, you need to know the aftermath, but you also need to know those personal experiences. And something we realized in New York is that the only way that we will truly never forget is if we are recalling those personal experiences. Because I tell you right now, it's real hard not to tear up in front of a 50-year-old Italian guy from Long Island who was, a, oh, who was a detective. And he's telling you how my family doesn't want to hear about 9-11 anymore. I can't talk about all the men that I lost that day. But when he goes to the Tribute Museum to give his tours and to talk to people about that day, they want to hear his story, they want to hear him talk, and they want to support him. How do we translate that to the youth so that they feel that without having to go into a dark cave like at the 9-11 National Museum and Memorial, without having to have this complete aesthetic emotional impact that they have in their everyday life, how do we translate those very real stories into long-term remembrance? Yeah. yeah, 
And on top of that, not even just looking at content, I guess where to do it in the school system is really important, how to incorporate that. Some people say it should be maybe an elective course. Some people say, no, it should be in, within you know, the US history course or contemporary civics. And finding that placement's really hard because it's that balance of, do, do I, can I keep everything? What do I have to let go? But I have to complete X, Y, and Z, but this is still important. And so I think right now, especially, teachers are struggling because students have questions. Right? You still have to stand every 9-11 on the anniversary, and you have to say, we will never forget. And you have that moment of silence. But as Dr. Warshower said, you're going to have a whole high school, what, next year? Next year. Next year, who will not be able to remember. And so, of course, that day will, there will arise questions. So how do you incorporate that into curriculum? I think that's something our class also, especially those who want to be future educators, kind of skewed and started to look at. And we kind of discussed various different teaching models and different books and different tools to help teachers. What would be best to put into the school system, but also what would be best to do in just as a casual incorporation of 9-11, right? Is it that build up through other topics that you would be able to connect to? Or does this belong in contemporary civics? We don't know where it goes, because then you have that foreign policy aspect as well. So it reaches that global scale. And so it really depends on what you want to focus on. And trying to have, make the decision of this is more important than the other for this type of event, any type of event in history, is very hard. Because that comes into play of historical memory over time. And you're responsible for that at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so for me, as an up-and-coming teacher, I've been thinking about this too. And I kind of I came at it from the reverse angle as Dr. Warshower, because uh, the trip to New York for me kind of made me realize the trauma and the memory of the first responders and the survivors. And I, and I thought to myself, how can I apply this to other categories in history, like the Civil War, and like other events in history that we don't have an emotional memory to? And I, and, and I want to try and find a way to connect uh, the students maybe to like a story from the Civil War. Uh, from a veteran who maybe wrote letters uh, and, and, and really personalize it, you know, to show even in ancient history, like Julius Caesar was a guy, you know, and we can, we can relate with him on an emotional level. And, that's, and that could be really powerful. So that was, that was definitely a journey for me to realize that, like, history really is the story of people at a fundamental level. And it, it sounds so basic, but it was really a, a cool journey for me. But it's our story, right, yeah. as Americans, and that's kind of what I'm saying is to be more informed for our future, we have to understand our past. We cannot turn a blind eye to the foreign relations that the U.S. has had abroad. Um, it's the very reason why that day happened. That's a hard thing to hear, and people don't want to hear that. But that's the history. That's the truth of it. And how do we teach that and convey it in a way where people hold it here and decide to be more informed citizens because of it? Um, you know, I'm sure Dr. Warshower can touch more on how culturally our nation has been so affected. You can't go to an airport now and really not think about 9-11. Um, but how is that changing? How is that changing? Like, again, you know, I'll mention again, Sri Lanka and using places of cultural importance as weapons against nations. Um, you really have to think about that because that's our new age of terrorism. Yeah. And one thing that is interesting that you mentioned, that, you know, to bring this into Civil War, when I started becoming interested in 9-11, it was in the midst of the Civil War project, and I started trying to, I, I, I didn't try, I did, I used 9-11 as a vantage point to talk with audiences about the Civil War and get them to understand the significance of that loss and of that trauma during the American Civil War. And I would say, I would say this was their 9-11, except it was way, way worse, right? 9,000 people have died as a result, direct, at least 9,000 Americans, I should say, have, largely Americans, have died as a result of 9-11. 3,000 in the attacks, though there are people from 90 different countries. And then 6,000 servicemen and women in the aftermath. Well, the Battle of Antietam on September 17th, 1862, there's 23,000 men who are killed and wounded in, the single, in, in 12 hours. In 12 hours. Gettysburg, 53,000 over three days. Right? So, I mean, those are one of those ways where you can make yeah. these connections. But I think, for me, the foreign policy component of it and understanding where the United States um, has been and is going in relation to 9-11 is incredibly important. And when I do in this 100-level course, and I've got a bunch of non-history majors, if I started that class out by saying, let's talk about American foreign policy from World War I up to the 21st century, I would have, I mean... Nobody would take it. You would just get <laughs> I'd have kids snoozing so fast in that class, it would be ridiculous. But when they have an end game, when they know that understanding foreign policy is going to lead to some sort of explanation of 
They're all in. And now they have an understanding of, uh, you know, a basic understanding of American foreign policy. But I say basic, but I think the majority of Americans don't even have a basic understanding of American foreign policy. But I know Dr. Partridge from Capitol has a question. Sure. Uh, uh, Dr. Warshaw, I was really interested in the things that you said about, uh, about you know, taking World War II and thinking about how there were the closures, there was this, this uh, unconditional surrender. There was an ending to that event. I grew up during the Cold War, and I remember, you know, having drills in our classroom of what would happen if there was a nuclear attack. Uh, we used to see documentaries or, you know, these kind of uh, public service announcement type type uh, documentaries about what to do and and what could happen and all duck of that. Duck and cover, right? Was that I, duck and cover? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Duck and cover. Um, I was not old enough to remember Sputnik, you know, that this whole thing, you know, some of the things that really started the Cold War, but I was living and my generation was living under this kind of unresolved issue, which we thought was resolved at the, at the and in some ways was in the 1990s, but then enters this new phase. And what I'm, what I'm interested in here is, is what this generation that you're talking about are young people today don't need to think about 9-11 or remember 9-11 to have the experience or to, to recognize as they start looking at it that they're living in a different world, a world where it, there was no, there's not just some wall that can come down, there, like in Berlin. There's not just some, you know, the, 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 the bombing and then there's the unconditional surrender. Uh, there, it's like this hydra where, we, you, you know, you've got this, this, terrorist activity and how do you, you know, you cut it off here and it grows up over there and you cut it off here, it grows up over there. So I would imagine that this is a little bit like that Cold War experience, but even worse because you don't know really who the enemy is and the enemy can come up at any time. We can have another 9-11 at any time and we are living in that age. So I, I wonder if maybe the panelists could talk about your, just your own personal experience living in that age, how you were aware of it before you took this course, and then how it's kind of developed since then. Let me say one thing real quick, and I'll turn it over to them because they're way more interesting than I am. Uh, I think the primary issue is the lack of resolution. There's just no resolution to any of this. And then when you pair one of the other major things that these kids who are in schools today have to deal with, it's a very, very similar concept, and it deals with violence, and that are all the school shootings, right? Violence can erupt at any moment in a school, and you never know when it's going to come. And it's very similar to a concept of terrorism, right? And my students have likened the two to each other, that it is this intense violence that just by going to work on a beautiful Tuesday morning, you could be killed in an office building. Just by showing up to school, you could be killed by going to school. And that, when there's no resolution over that, and it becomes this overwhelming anxiety factor, even if it's not on your mind all the time, it's in the back of your mind. So, you guys? Yeah, we're, you know, something we haven't mentioned yet that you touched upon was that we're not in what Dr. Warshower is referencing with um, Pearl Harbor and even with the Cold War and what you mentioned with the Berlin Wall is that there's a start and an end because we know who we're up against, right? With this, it's more of an ideology. And I, I have my own theory that, you know, this ideology born out of terrorism and extremism, um, out, as it's been worded to us over time, right? has been combated with another ideology that's nationalistic tendencies in our country. Over time, as we did not find a resolution for this war and we invaded Iraq and got increasingly more involved in Middle Eastern politics, another ideology amongst the American people emerged, right? And this is one that becomes an antithesis of the other, right? This fear. And if I am so afraid and in and of myself, then I might be able to protect myself in some kind of way. If I am anti the other, then the other cannot infiltrate my life. Well, that's just unrealistic, right? These things, as you mentioned, and as Dr. Warshower mentioned, have transcended themselves to become something else, right, over time. Um, I was in fifth grade the morning of the attacks, and my story is exactly the same as the ones that you heard um, from Dr. Warshower's book. I got picked up, I, I went home, my mom was super afraid. Um, and now I have a seven-year-old daughter who on the first day of school every year I have to tell her, okay, honey, what do we do in case something happens? So 
Was I more prepared to give my daughter that talk because I grew up in an age of fear as well? Yes, but I would argue that the fear that was put forth in the Cold War, which I cannot speak to because I was not there, is likely very different than the one that we're experiencing today, where again, at any moment, right? And we don't have shelter in place. We, we haven't made it so that we could be afraid here in America on a daily basis. We're a very fortunate country. But you go to somewhere else, and these attacks are happening far more frequently. So we have privilege here, right? We, we experience an attack, but yet we're still safe. But we live in a place of fear, and we protect that fear with ideologies that are now combative and at the scale of the same ideology that came at us in the first place. I hope that makes mm. sense. <laughs> and to contribute to that, I think the idea of the ideology resonates a lot. And that's also because those who are growing up now, especially with no memory of 9-11 and even myself, um, if I wasn't so interested in history, like when I talked to my brothers, my older siblings about this, they don't remember sometimes that we're currently at war. Right, this is very different for America because we didn't declare war officially. We know, you know, we have friends, we have family, we know of people who are going over, right? Going over, fighting, coming back after their tour. But we don't acknowledge it in everyday society. We're not seeing propaganda out. We're not, we don't have to pay with bonds. We're not trying to support our troops. That statement doesn't appear in everyday conversation anymore at least not, not in the conversations that I've been having, not in the conversations in the past 10 years. Support our troops, that's, it's not happening. And I think that resonates a lot differently, especially when growing up the Cold War era, because you're always facing it, right? You're facing it in every day. Now, this generation has to face it subconsciously. It's always in the back of our minds, right? But it had these devastating repercussions that are in our everyday lives, but unless you're being that analyst instead of a viewer, and thinking about those repercussions, you're not going to see them in front of you because they're not in full view. They're not getting shoved. They're not, your outside world, this is all you've known. You've never known of time of where everyone is talking about war all the time. You haven't had to pay bonds. You, yeah, you see people go overseas, but you're not seeing anything further because now you don't have the conversation. You were having the conversation then. You're not having in-school drills about it because to an extent, there's nothing you could do. And I think that was more accepted because now we saw it, right? At least during the Cold War and in World War II, we've never experienced the trauma in which others were afflicted with. And now that we've experienced a piece of it, we don't know how to still react and handle it because there's no preparation that could happen. And I think everyone around now realizes that. And that's why it's so prominent within this 9-11 generation. Because now everyone wants control in a situation where they have none and will have none. I think that's the greatest fear, isn't it? To have no control. Yeah. I mean, um, a very famous saying uh, among many branches of the military in the midst of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars was, we went to war, America went to the mall. A very well-known phrase among those in the military where you know we had all these support our troop signs out there but what were we really doing to engage with the war servicemen would come home and women would come home and it didn't look like America was at war at all and that has another so there's a whole other component of psychological impact for our soldiers that's related but not the same as for the civilians yeah as a as a wannabe historian I'm always hesitant to <laughs> I'm always hesitant to, to say, let's learn from this event and then correct all the mistakes in today and, and then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll just know all the answers because no two events are exactly the same. Um, that being said, I'll, I'll break my own rule by making a comparison to World War II, Britain. Um, a peer of mine wrote this paper about how in World War II, uh, Adolf Hitler thought that if he kept bombing the cities of, of London and, and the big cities, Manchester, in in, in the Battle of Britain, then the British would just give up and they would, they would surrender and then it would be over. And the opposite happened. Uh, the, the paper was basically premised on the fact that if you bomb a people, they become more resolved. And I think that I can make that comparison here because we've become used to it, right? We were almost desensitized to the fact that terrorist attacks happen all the time. And I mean, we give the example of Sri Lanka, which happened two days ago, right? Um, and so I think that as a, as a population and as a, as a youth today, we are very on alert and we are very ready at all times in a certain way, uh, whether it's terrorist attacks, whether it's school shootings, whether it's 
gun violence, whatever kind of thing it is, it's, it's, it's in our face, and whether that's because of the media, because of technology makes it just in your face right now, uh, we're used to that, you know, as young people today. Um, but again, I can't speak for, for your personal experience in growing up in the 80s or the 70s, because I'm sure it, it is a lot different in many ways, but that's how I see it. Um, I would add, too, just one more thing real quick, is that we live in a, a consumer <clears throat> culture, right? And we have so much choice in this culture as to curating what kind of news we do want to see and what we want to be exposed to. And in our day and age, as you know, the, this generation, um, that affords us this ability to kind of be ignorant to some of the things that are going on. And I mean ignorant in the sense of just like blindly not even knowing, not even caring, because look at this tweet of a cute puppy, you know, something like that. Um, and, and that consumer culture really gave way when George Bush was, was at Ground Zero and said, now go shopping. I don't know if anybody remembers that. So we have to, when we're thinking about this and when we're teaching it and when we're discussing it, position it in this cultural sense, you know, and, and really take that and look at how Americans reacted to that because of all of this that we have, because of our consumer culture, both tangibly and intangibly. Mm. Yeah, for, for me too, sorry. No, I was just going to ask other questions oh, if anybody has other questions. Uh, yeah, just Go one ahead. more thing. For me, too, I, I try and get ahead of the ball game. Um, there's that famous quote that says, Americans learn geography through war, right? <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I'll use the Sri Lanka example again. I was on the phone with my grandparents talking about it, and my grandpa was very humble. He was like, where is Sri Lanka? And I was like, yeah, uh, it's the little teardrop island under India. You know, a lot of people don't know that, and and I, I think a lot of Americans just don't think that it's important until it gets attacked, right? Or until we have to go send troops there or something like that. So, I've really taken. I, I think that we, as a community, as an, as Americans, we have to learn about these countries, learn about world, especially world affairs, and especially like Middle Eastern politics, and so that we know these places, we know what they're like, and so that we can we can take a real approach to sort of circumstances when they come at us. Questions? I mean, I suppose where I'm at with this subject matter is because I, I, I would argue that, that culturally, nationally, as a nation, we are still in the grips of 9-11 of PTSD to some extent. And whenever you're dealing it, and I think, again, when you get to the personal level issue, Whenever something happens in your life that brings you to a particular point and where you need to go and you, you, maybe you go and talk with, with a counselor or something and you're trying to figure out, you know, what, what's the first thing that a counselor or somebody you go and talk to, what's the first thing that they say to you? They want to know, well, what's your story, right? What has occurred that has led you to this time, to this moment? Where, where are you at? What's happened in your past? Um, and we need to sort of think about that and deal with that so we can move forward. This is exactly how the military is dealing with soldiers who have confronted PTSD, is to try and take them back to the moment, understand the feeling, move forward, and sort of struggle with, with the issue and, and learn from it. Um, I don't think America is there yet with 9-11. You know? uh, quite often what historians will say is at least 20 years have to pass before we learned something. I mean, think about how long it took us to learn the ramifications and the after effect of the Vietnam War, right? 50, 60 years? We're still dealing with some of the issues there. I guess one of my big questions for this book that I'm working on now is that can America look at the impact of 9-11 and where it sits in our history and gain a greater understanding of it sooner than 50 years? Can we come to understand that sooner rather than later? Okay. Well, we'll see. Uh, so, uh, if you have any questions, we have to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. I know, it, it is. It's a big. It's a big subject, and it's got a tremendous number of of tentacles to it. And there's really a lot of ways that you can look at it. And so, maybe we have like two minutes left. All right, so we'll, maybe we'll finish with it like this. So when we were looking at 9-11, really from this macro point of view, and we went to the Tribute Museum, and the Tribute Museum is, is, most Americans don't know anything about it. It's a really, really fascinating place with a very, very uplifting message. And we met a guy uh, there. It was one of the first talks he'd ever given, Gordon. Remember Gordon? Yeah. Right? So we talked with Gordon, and he was probably in his mid-50s. 
he had been a, um, a combat medic in the Air Force. And a result of his experience as a combat medic, he uh, went to medical school and became an emergency room doctor. He had grown up in Chinatown. And so he said, listen, he goes, when you're talking about the World Trade Center, he goes, you're talking about my backyard. He goes, this is where I learned to ride a bike. This is where I learned to ride a skateboard. He goes, this is where we hung out on the weekends. When all, you know, on Sundays especially, when there weren't that many tourists and Wall Street was closed, it's like, this is where we hung out. And he goes, so um, I, I, on 9-11, he goes, I was in the city. And he goes, I was drawn to the World Trade Center. I just, he goes, I'm not a hero. He goes, I didn't go down there because I wanted to help people. I just was drawn. He goes, before I knew it, I was standing four blocks away from the North Tower watching it crumble. And he said, and you know how, uh, what a hand grenade is, how it explodes and sends shrapnel out in all directions? He goes, that's what the World Trade Center was. He says, it was shooting projectiles just from the force of the collapse. And he goes, a guy standing next to me was killed instantly. He goes, I don't even know what killed him. He just, he was killed instantly. And he said, so I started running. The dust cloud was coming. And I, he goes, I just booked it. I started running. He goes, where did I run? He goes, I ran to the hospital not where he practiced, but where he had had a meeting. He was supposed to have a meeting that day, which obviously he didn't go to because, you know, lower Manhattan was on fire. And so he goes to this hospital and says, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an emergency room doctor. Do you need help? And they said, yes, but the ER is filled with people who are fleeing the World Trade Center. And they put him in a conference room, like, like it was a third or fourth floor conference room. And they set him up with a suture kit. And he said, I just sat there and I sewed people up for the better part of the day. And he says, and the thing that I remember most are the women who came in. They all had feet that were cut up. And if you go to the 9-11 Museum, what are you going to see? Tons of shoes. Because women throw their high heel shoes to the side so they can run faster. And they cut their feet up on the glass and the steel and all this. So he sews up people's feet. And he tells us this story. And we think that that's his 9-11 story. And we're all sitting there riveted. And he says, but that's not really why I'm here telling you about this story. He goes, I'm really here to tell you about my sister Susan. So Susan worked for Compaq Computers, and she was on Windows in the World that day in the North Tower, and she didn't make it out. She was trapped above the impact zone. And he said, and I, I, I'm here to tell you about Susan. And uh, he says, Susan was a very amazing person. He said, you know, we had ultimately, my family had moved outside of Chinatown and had moved to uh, New Jersey. But every Sunday, we would drive in together and we, my sister would teach Sunday school at the church that we had always gone to go to. And he says, um, so we would get in the car, and no one was allowed to talk in the car. No radio, no conversation, no chatter, nothing, until Susan had had an opportunity to look through all of the materials for what she was going to be teaching that day. And then when she finished, she would say, okay, we can all talk now. And then everybody would start talking. And he goes, my response was always the same every Sunday. I would look at her and go, Susan, there are only five. You know, she's like prepping. And he goes, so th th that's my sister Susan. And he says, I'm here at the Tribute Museum to tell my sister's story. And he goes, and now that all of you have heard of it, you all know Susan too. So now she won't be forgotten. And that's the way he ended his talk. And I think that is the kind of thing that brought us around from looking at 9-11 from this huge, just gigantic subject to going, Wow, okay, when we tell this history, we can't forget to tell the story of Susan and, and all of the other people who perished. But I would argue to you, if that's the only <coughs> thing we focus on, then we're losing a serious opportunity for, for learning because our goal as human beings should be to make a better world. And I think the direction that the United States goes, many directions the United States goes in the aftermath of the 9-11 does not help to make a better world. It, it sends us in the wrong direction. And, and we as a nation need to come to grips with some of that. I think in, in the minds of most Americans, I think they believe and truly believe and they want to contribute to, to being a great nation, right? And being a nation that can be a model for other nations in the world, and that the basis of our representative democracy and our commitment to human rights is something that genuinely matters. And I think we go off track as a result of 9-11 because we're angry, because we're hurt, because we feel vengeance. And it's something that we need to think about as this 20th anniversary rolls around. So with that, thank you all for coming. Thank we appreciate you. your thank time. You.
Thanks. Nice job. Thanks. Thank you.